to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ jesus said every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be torn down or thrown into the fire. Matthew 15, verse number 13. We welcome you today to our study of fundamentals of the faith as we're thinking about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus said, every plant that is planted is not from God. Some are going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus wasn't talking about trees or plants really, for in the next statement he says, of the Pharisees and their religion. They're blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. Jesus was talking about religious groups started by men. How do we know what religious group is from God? How do we know what church is the church of the New Testament? And what can we do to make sure that we're right with God? You know, we live in a world that says it, it really doesn't even matter today. You can do whatever you want, and that's fine. Today we're going to consider what the Bible teaches about the New Testament church. And we're so glad that you joined us for our Bible study together today. We want to encourage you to get your Bible and have it ready as we're going to be using the Word of God to understand more about the Lord's church. As always, we want to encourage you to visit the Lord's church in your area. If you've not ever been to the church, you'll find people there who love God, friendly people who are concerned about men and women's souls. And so won't you check out the Lord's Church in your area? If you'd like to study the Bible, know more about the church or the plan of salvation, you'll find people there who love God, love others, and will be happy to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you. Friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of the Word of God. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a good variety of Bible study material. We have all of our audio lessons, all of our video lessons on every book of the Bible and a multiplicity of topics available to you free of charge. Transcripts, study questions, written material, just a good resource for studying to supplement our study of the Word of God as well. And if you'd like to have a copy of any of our lessons, today's lesson or any of our previous lessons, you can write to us or call us. We'll be glad to make that available. You can visit our website, request a media, uh, download a media request form, and there you can fill that out, and we'll be glad to send that to you in the mail as well. Also, we now have available for our phones, smartphones, uh, uh, app for the Android and Apple phones. You can get those from the respective marketplaces as well. And so won't you check that out too. Today we're thinking about the Lord's Church. And as we mentioned er at the outset of our lesson, sometimes people don't give a lot of thought to whether it even matters. Does it even matter what church one belongs to? Isn't one as good as another? And what does God teach about this idea? A well, friend, one can't be as good as another for Jesus clearly died for His church. And that church is spoken of in the Bible. And we've got to realize that, that man's standard cannot be God's standard as it relates to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what can we know today about the church that Jesus built and established in the Bible? Let's open our Bible and see. Let's begin with this question. The church that we want to be a part of that's mentioned in the Bible who started that church? Who founded it? Who originated that church? Well, friend, Jesus did, and He has to be both the founder and the foundation according to Scripture. Open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I want you to see what the Bible says about Jesus being the foundation. 1 Corinthians 3, look at verse number 11 with me. The Apostle Paul mentions this idea from 1 Corinthians 3, Verse number 11, Paul says, For no other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid, 
which is Jesus Christ. Jesus must be the foundation of the church because He Himself is the one who started it or founded it. We'll mention this verse probably several times in our lesson, but Matthew 16, Jesus comes to His disciples and He says to them, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Some say Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood. Men didn't tell you this, but my Father who is in heaven. And he said, I say to you that you're Peter. You're a small stone, but on this rock, the fact that He's the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Who started, according to that verse, who founded and who started the church of the Bible? Men didn't do that. Some man, 500, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 years later, didn't start the Lord's church in the Bible. The church we read of in the New Testament, Jesus said, I'll build my church. And He did exactly that. Thus, there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He's the founder. He's the foundation. And only in Him is there salvation. Well, let's ask another question about the church of the Bible. When did it start? Did it start? In the Reformation period? Did it start in the Restoration period? Did it start in the last hundred, two hundred years when most religious groups started? When did the church of the Bible start? I want you to look in your Bible in Daniel chapter 2 for just a moment. And I want you to see the prophecy that Daniel makes about the church that we read of in the Bible. Look in Daniel chapter 2 and notice what he says. Daniel has this vision. And in this vision, we learn that one of the eternal kingdom is going to be founded at a certain time. Daniel 2, notice verse 44. The Bible says, In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and con consume all these kingdoms. Now listen to this, and it shall stand forever. In the days of these kings, you've got the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Greek, and Roman era uh, that's spoken of. Those are the four kingdoms that are, going to, that are mentioned with the time frame of Daniel. In the time of the Babylonian kingdom, or the Medo-Persian, or the Greek kingdom, did God set up a new kingdom? No. He's still reigning through the kingdom of Israel. But during the time of the Roman era, a new kingdom arrives. Jesus said this, Mark 9 verse 1, Jesus said to His disciples, Assuredly I say to you, there are some standing here today who will not taste death until you see the kingdom present with power. That's the promise of a new kingdom that's coming during the lifetime of Jesus' uh, disciples there. Well, well, did that kingdom happen? And what is it? It absolutely happened. For in Colossians 1 verse 13, Paul said, God translated some out of the kingdom of darkness, listen now, into the kingdom of His dear Son. Well, what is that kingdom? I want you to think again about Jesus' promise to build the church in Matthew 16, 18. You remember it. Jesus said, I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now watch what He says next. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The church and the kingdom are one and the same. We know that. For in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, the Bible says, The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. The kingdom God established in the New Testament is the church, which is used as a synonym for the kingdom. The kingdom and the church are one and the same. And so when was the church founded? Friend, the church was promised to be started during the time of the Roman period. Jesus said it would happen during the time of His apostles. We know according to Acts chapter 2, the church was established as a reality in the first century because people were already added to it in Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. And so here's the point we make. If the church was established in the first century, 
what about all these religious groups that came 500, 700, 1,000, 2,000 years after that? Friend, it doesn't fit the identity, the unique nature of the Lord's church. I want to be a part, a person wants to be a part of the church Jesus died for. He shed His blood for His church. Acts 20 verse 20, He purchased the church with His own blood. Acts 20 verse 28, He built the church. Matthew 16, 18, people who were saved were added to His church in the Bible, and I want to be a part, not of a man-made organization, but of the church that Jesus Himself died for and gave His life for. Well, when exactly, where exactly was it promised that the Lord's church would be started at? Now, we're talking about identifying characteristics. We know who started it. We know when, that it was during the Roman era. It happened during the first century. Does the Bible tell us where geographically the Lord's church would be founded? And it absolutely does. Open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 2, and I want you to see the prophecy about where God's kingdom would emanate, where it would start from. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains, it shall be exalted above the hills, all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, and we shall walk in His paths. Now notice, For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. God's house, which 1 Timothy 3.15 says, the church of the living God is the house of God. God's house, God's church, His kingdom. Where was it going to start at? Jerusalem, or as it says here, in Zion. This prophecy also occurs in Micah chapter 4. It's clear that Micah 4 and Isaiah 2 are talking about the same thing. Well, did that happen in the Bible? Did the church of the Lord Jesus Christ start in Jerusalem? It absolutely did. Jesus promised He'd build it. He prophesied it would occur during the time of His uh, disciples. And in Acts chapter 2, we open our Bible, and Peter stands up with the eleven. For the very first time, he preaches Jesus Christ and salvation as a, no longer as a prophecy, as a present reality. They cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're told to repent, be baptized for the remission of their sins. And the Bible says for the first time, Acts 2 verse 47, the Lord added to the church those who are being saved. The church was established in Acts 2 in Jerusalem just as was promised in the Bible. Now, what again is the practical application of that? Friend, if the church was started in England or Rome or the Americas, that's thousands of miles from where the Bible prophesied the house of God and the church of the living God would be started. And so, again, another identifying characteristic about the Lord's church. Well, let's ask another question then. Who does the church belong to? Friend, I want to ask you to consider this idea with me for just a moment because oftentimes men put the wrong emphasis on religious groups today. In the Bible, who does the church belong to? I want you to turn there with me. We've mentioned it several times, but I want you to see it for yourself. Would you open your Bible with me to Matthew 16? Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 16, verse number 18. Who does the church belong to? Jesus said, And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Whose church did Jesus build? Did Jesus say, on these rocks I'll build somebody else's church? Did Jesus say, on these rocks I'll build my churches? No. On this rock, I, singular, will build my singular church. Jesus built the church. The church belongs to Christ. You know why the church belongs to Christ? Friend, Jesus is the only one who could pay the price to build the church. What do we mean by that? Acts chapter 20. Verse number 28, the Bible says to the elders in Ephesus, Paul said, Shepherd the church of the Lord, which he purchased 
with his own blood. Why is it Jesus is the only one who could build the church? Because he's the only one that could pay the price for the church. It's his sinless blood, Hebrews 4.15, that paid the price and established the church. Now someone says, okay, that's all good and well, but what, what does that apply to? How does that apply today? Well, friend, if I put my name on the church, or I put someone else's name on the church, or I put some other religious act on the church, is that giving glory to the one who built and bought the church? We can understand that. We can understand the importance of someone's name being on something that's theirs today, right? Uh, for example, if you buy a home, your name is on the deed of that home. You wouldn't put your neighbor's name. You wouldn't put your friend's name. You wouldn't put somebody else's name on it. Uh, we understand it as it relates to the paycheck, for example. If you have a paycheck, your name's on that. You're not going to sign that over to me. Why not? Because you worked for that. Your sweat and blood, your tears went into that. Your effort accumulated that. Well, friend, Jesus built his church. Why, why would we want to put somebody else's name on that? who didn't build it and didn't pay the price for the church. And friend, as we think about the unique nature of the church, let's also realize this. The Bible teaches Christ only built one church. Remember Jesus' statement again, I will build my church, singular. And the Bible teaches over and over again that He only built one church. It's not God's plan. It is not God's will that there be thousands of denomination and religious groups today. That's not God's plan. Jesus built one church. Let me show you that in the Bible. Turn to the book of Ephesians with me, and I want you to see this idea for yourself. Look in Ephesians chapter 1, and I want you to see what the Bible says about the oneness of the church. Look in Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to look at what the Bible says. Look, if you would, in verses 22 and 23. Concerning this, the Bible says, And He, God, put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. And so Jesus is head over the church. Now notice this, which is His body. And so the Bible teaches that the church and the body are the same, that they're synonyms used for the same thing. Now, if that's the case, look in Ephesians 4, verse 4. Notice what the Bible says about these singular things in Ephesians 4, verse 4. The Bible says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Notice that statement at the very outset. There's one body. And friend, we realize one here means one and only one. There's one God, right? There's one faith, right? There's one Savior. One in every way. Now listen to this. There's one body. Okay, think about this with me for just a moment. The body is the church. We saw that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. If the body is the church, and the Bible just said there's only one body, how many churches are there? There was only in ever intended to be one church. There are many members, yet but one body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. Uh, Colossians 3, 15. You are called into one body, and be ye thankful. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 20, Paul emphasized again, many members yet one body. There's, there's, uh, we're all, those who've obeyed the gospel are part of Christ's church, but there aren't a multiplicity of religious groups that Jesus established and all the denominational chaos that's out there. That was never according to God's plan. And so Christ only built one church. Well, where then does that leave denominational division? dividing and naming churches after men and all the denominating that occurs today. Is that God's will? Is that scriptural? Open your Bible, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 1, and I want you to see that the idea of denominationalism 
naming one, naming after another, or the idea of dividing in the name of Christ, that's not according to God's plan. Look in your own Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want you to look in verses 10 through 13. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 13. Paul says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you all be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are divisions among you, or contentions among you. Now I say this, Each of you says, I am of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Friend, what do we learn from this passage? Paul said, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, let there be no divisions among you. You see, some people were saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a member of Christ's body, I'm just a follower. I'm, we're of the sect of Paul. We're of the sect of Peter. We're of the sect of Apollos. We're all part of that one big universal body. We're just the Paulites or the Cephites or the followers of Apollos. What did Paul say about that? No. Let there be no divisions among you. Now, friend, if it was wrong then to follow after men and their names, and divide the body of Christ then, how can it be wrong right today? How can it be right to follow Wesley or to follow Calvin or to follow a certain act like baptism and name a church after those men or those acts? How can that be right today? Let there be no division among you. What's unique about the church of Christ today, the Lord's church, we plead. Our plea with people is, let's have unity. Jesus prayed for it, right? John 17, verse 20 and 21, I pray that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world might believe you sent me. The Lord's church makes a plea for unity, unity, real unity, based upon the Word of God and the teaching of the inspired Word of God. Well, friend, if we put all these things together today, all the identifying characteristics and all the things we see, what church would the Bible, just the Bible alone, produce? Would it produce modern denominationalism today? Now you think about this with me. Let's say there's a group of people in our world who've never heard about America and American religion. They don't know anything about all the religious chaos that exists today. And we're, we want to teach these people about God and about Christ and about His church. And so we take these people a Bible and we say, read this Bible, do what it says. They look at the Bible, uh, they begin to read it in their language, they understand it, they do what it says, and they decide they're going to become Christians, they're going to become a part of the church you read about in the Bible. All they've got is the Bible. What church would they become a part of? If all they have is the Bible, they couldn't become anything other the New Testament Christians. They couldn't become anything more than members of the Lord's church. You see, in the Bible, that's what we read about. What did New Testament, what's the New Testament church called? In this book, what's the church called? Acts 8, 1, it's called the church. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, it's the church of God. Acts 20, verse 28, it's the church of the Lord. Romans 16, 16, it's called the, the churches of Christ. All the descriptions of the church in this book give God and give Christ the glory. They're the ones whom the church follows. They're the ones whom the church glorifies. You, you don't find men's names or religious acts' names anywhere on the church in this book. And so... If all you had was the Bible, and the Bible only, what church could you produce? What church would you find? What would the people who are members of that church be called? Not by modern denominational names. In the Bible, they were just simply called Christians. Acts 11 verse 26, they were disciples of Christ. Acts 20 verse 7, they were called children of God. 1 John 3 verse 1, they're referred to as servants. 
Romans 6, 16, they're called brethren. 1 Corinthians 15, 6, all the names that we find are names that you find in the Bible and in the Scriptures. And so today, as we think about the Lord's church, friend, we want to encourage you to just simply go back to the Bible. <clears throat> Here's the plea that we make today. In a world that is filled with religious chaos and confusion, where there's so much denominationalism and people doing things in the name of, of other men, can't we just go back to the Bible and have real unity by being a part of Christ's church and by following Christ's doctrine? Can't we put aside all the ideas and, and doctrines of men that we may not find in the Bible and just do what the Bible says? That's what really God wants us to do. He wants us to have unity based on His teaching and His Word. And so, friend, we ask you today, are you a member of the Lord's church? Have you done what they did in the first century to be added to the church? In Acts chapter 2, Peter preached Jesus as the Christ and they believed that. Have you heard the message about Jesus Christ that there's no other salvation except in Him? Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Do you believe that? Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Would you do what else Peter told them to do? Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins? Would you turn from a life of sin? As Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, <clears throat> you'll all likewise perish. And to have every sin washed away, to be added to the Lord's church, would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? The Bible says those who gladly received His word were baptized. Acts 2, verse 42 following. And as we've mentioned, those same people the Lord, not men, added Him to His church. And so, again, we're so glad that you've joined us for our study on fundamentals of the Christian faith. We hope and pray that you'll join us next time as we think about more fundamentals of the Bible and of our faith as we study the Word of God together more in our next lesson. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the